All right, well, I've read the text, so we've already got a head start. Let's go ahead and dive in, beginning with what we've seen thus far. Remember, we've seen, (coughs) excuse me, the preparation for the Great Commission, Jesus' appearances to his disciples after his death to make them the witnesses of his resurrection, his command to evangelize, beginning in Jerusalem, then moving outward to Judea, Samaria, and finally to the world. His ascension and coronation that would give him the power and the authority to make sure that the disciples are successful, to make sure that we are successful, and the disciples committing themselves to prayer that they might receive the power that Jesus promised, okay, prayer which we need to be engaged in. Now, last week, we saw the power for the Great Commission, the Lord sending His Spirit on the day of Pentecost, not only to prove that Jesus was exalted, but to empower His disciples. We saw the effect that had on Peter as he stood up to preach, and how the Lord used that sermon to convict and convert 3,000 people. I imagine a lot more were convicted than were actually converted. And we saw how the Spirit of God transformed the lives of these Jews who believed. Remember that um, perhaps a number of these people were those who called out for the crucifixion of Christ. Remember the crucifixion took place at the time of the Passover, so the people who were gathered together at at the Passover would be the same people who were gathered together on Pentecost. All the Jewish males that uh, were of age who had gone through their bar mitzvah, they had to come to the three feasts annually at Jerusalem. But these who called out for his crucifixion were changed. Now they were devoting themselves to God's truth as they learned it from the apostles. They were hungry for that truth. They wanted to know. And so they listened to the, the teaching and continued in that. They continued to meet together for fellowship. And to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which they appear to be doing often, which is the reason why we have it every week. And how they were willing to give up their possessions to support those who had just come to Jesus Christ, who were there for the feast and had not really planned on being there for very long. But they sold their possessions so that they could support them during the time that they were being discipled, so that they could return home and hopefully plant churches where they were from. Now this morning we see the progress of the Great Commission, and that's really going to take the rest of the entire book. And technically, it's, we should call it the further progress, because progress began uh, last time on the day of Pentecost, as we were just reminded, Peter's sermon in Jerusalem at Pentecost, the conversion of 3,000. Now, these converts weren't only from Jerusalem, as I said, but they had come from all over the Roman Empire to celebrate the, uh, the Feast of um, of Pentecost, and then they returned home after they were discipled, and perhaps the Lord did this in order to jumpstart the Great Commission, you know, His missions program. Uh, We do, for instance, later find a church established in in Rome uh, where no apostle had had yet gone. Uh, When when, uh, Paul is writing the letter to the the Romans, he's talking about his desire to, to see them and to impart some gift to them that he had not been there. That's why he, had, why he wrote this letter, to make sure that they understood very clearly the gospel. And you know, it's interesting, too, that later on in the book of Acts, we're going to find a group of disciples in Ephesus who were disciples of John the Baptist. And they hadn't even heard about the gospel. But, but John the Baptist, who never really went outside of, of Judea, Uh, his disciples were going other places teaching people about what John was teaching. So we should assume the same thing was happening with regard to the gospel message. Now, at the same time, we also need to understand that this did not change Jesus' marching orders to his disciples. They still had work to do. And uh, that's what we see this morning. So I want us to consider three things in our passage. Uh, First of all, remember that we're looking at the continuing of the evangelism of Jerusalem. First, the sign that the Lord gives to authenticate his messengers. Uh, Second, uh, Peter's second sermon and again his testimony of Jesus' resurrection. And then finally, the results of the second sermon, conversion, but also persecution. I've already given you those heads, but maybe now that I've given you them the second time, Uh, it'll be easier to follow. So first of all, we see the sign 
Jesus gives. Luke tells us that Peter and John went up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of, of prayer. Uh, one thing that perhaps we know about the Jews is that it was customary for the Jews to pray not just once a week on the Sabbath and not even just once a day, but three times a day. The psalmist writes in, in Psalm 55, verse 17, Evening and morning and at noon, I will complain and murmur, and he will hear my voice. That's talking about prayer. By the way, this is the way the Jews calculated time. They did, went from, from sundown to sundown. So evening, morning, and noon. This is what Daniel practiced even in a foreign land. Remember, and even after Darius the king had made it illegal for anyone to pray to anyone but, but him, we read this in Daniel 6.10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. So basically, these prayer times were at the third hour, the sixth hour, and the ninth hour, which correlate to nine in the morning, 12 noon, and three in the afternoon which I suppose being close to sundown would be evening uh, for the Jews. Now, this was their custom. This was not a command, but it's a good custom. And as a matter of fact, we might even say a good example for us in the Bible because our Lord tells us to pray without ceasing. This is how the Lord does His work. So from these examples and from this command, uh, I think we need to examine ourselves and and consider whether we're praying as much as we should be praying. And again, not praying with a legalistic spirit. You know, that God will give me so many merits and ducats or whatever if I pray X amount of time, like Luther may have before his conversion. But, but praying out of thankfulness and out of love and a desire to see God's kingdom grow. So that's what we assume that, that Peter and John were doing as they were coming up to the temple at the hour of prayer. Now, as they were going up, and I'm sure also looking for an opportunity to evangelize, there was a man they saw who had been lame his whole life, who was seated every day at the gate of the temple called Beautiful. Uh, Josephus tells us about the temple, that the temple had nine gates. Remember, this temple was torn down by the Romans, so we, we really don't have a model of it, okay? But why this one was called beautiful isn't really known for sure. I'm not sure that, that he recorded that or even knew himself, but it's likely called that because it was the most ornate of the nine. But if, if it was the most beautiful, certainly the best place if you're going to beg, you know, most people probably want to go in through that gate. So he was placed there that he might beg alms. And when he saw Peter and John, he began asking them for money. Now, Peter told him, we don't have any, but what they did have, they would gladly share. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, notice not our power, but his power, in his name, walk. Then they lifted him up by the right hand, raised him up immediately, his feet and his ankles were strengthened, and he leaped to his feet, and entering the temple with them, he was walking and leaping and praising God. Sounds like a, some sort of a hymn that I've heard. Uh, before. Now, as we can imagine, this must have been a real attention getter, right? Because the people knew who he was. They had seen him sitting at that gate for, for years, perhaps, and they were filled when they saw him with, again, with uh, wonder, which means with awe and fear. One thing that we don't want to miss is, you know, when they wonder, it's not some sort of a glowy kind of a feeling. It's a, it's a fear that strikes your heart. What's going on here? And they were beside themselves with amazement. They couldn't believe what they were looking at. So they all came to get a closer look. Now, we know that Jesus did this miracle. And we need to ask the question why he did this miracle. And one question uh, would, would be, or one possible interpretation that we hear today was that Jesus wanted to show the Jews and he wanted to show the church and he wanted to show the church today that he wants us all to be healthy and wealthy. Well, is, is that what he was trying to show us here? No. 
Okay, now we know this was an act of compassion. We know the Lord had mercy on this man. We know that he was concerned about him. He had been lame since he was born. But we don't have to read very far in Scripture to see that Jesus never healed everyone. Certainly didn't heal the Apostle Paul, who had to take some wine, as it were. His eyes were, were having difficulty. I should say Timothy was the one he told to drink wine for his frequent ailments. And Paul was talking about um, how one church would have gladly given him, given him their eyes. I think he was uh, perhaps referring to the, to the Galatians. But the idea is Jesus didn't heal everyone because it's not always his will that we be healthy or that we be wealthy. There's actually very few wealthy Christians who really love him. Jesus, the Bible tells us, has chosen the poor to be rich in faith because the poor are the ones who look to him for their needs to be met. Okay, so all suffering is not a lack of faith. That's what, again, faith healers will teach you. The main reason Jesus did this miracle was, you know, not just as an act of compassion, but he wanted to get the Jews' attention. He wanted them to know that Peter and John were his messengers. He wanted them to listen to their message. Now, one thing we need to think about is how does that work today? You know, do we do miracles today? Do we do signs today in order to get people to pay attention to what we have to say? Well, no, we can't because the Lord doesn't give these signs anymore. He's already authenticated His messengers with the miracles that are in the Bible. As a matter of fact, remember, um, the Roman church believed that miracles were continuing during the medieval time, during the Reformation time, during the early church, right? And when the Protestant Reformation was coming about, they asked the Protestants, you know, here are the miracles that prove that our doctrine is true. Where are your miracles? Well, what John Calvin did, he's, he says, our miracles are right here in the Bible. They are recorded by reliable eyewitnesses, and these prove our teaching, our doctrine, our message. We well, see, we have to take the same approach that John Calvin did in his day and that the Reformers have since, since those days. We need to point to the Bible because these are real miracles that took place where God authenticated His message. And the message he gave us is a consistent message that agrees with itself, unlike Rome. Now, God doesn't give signs today. We point to these signs, but he does do other things to wake people up to their need, to cause them to become concerned, like he did these Jews. He just doesn't do miracles. More often than not, he uses difficulties. And I think the fires that take place, of course, during the dry season, the hurricanes that take place, after the dry season down in the Florida area, COVID-19 and these other things are things the Lord uses to wake people up, to pay attention to what He has to say in nature so that they begin to look for a revelation that comes through the Word. Okay, so He still does things to get people's attention. And we need to take advantage of those when, when they come as best as we are able. So, this was a miracle to get the people's attention so that they would listen to what Peter had to say. Secondly, we see his message. When he saw the people coming together, first of all, he didn't want to take credit for what had just happened. So the first thing he did was to give glory to the Lord. And of course, that's what we always need to be doing, isn't it? If God does something through us, don't pat ourselves on the back and, and think about how wonderful we are and tell people how wonderful we are. But give glory to God. Now, I was at a pastor's conference years ago. You probably heard me talk about it before. I repent <laughs> because it wasn't, it wasn't really a good one. But Oral Roberts was there, and he was a guest speaker. And on, on one part of his presentation, he raised his hands before all the pastors because this was a pastor's conference, and I was a part of Calvary Chapel in those days. That was a very charismatic Calvary Chapel. He raised his hands, and he boasted how many people he had healed with these hands, these hands that the Lord has used to lay hands on so many thousands of people and to heal them. He wanted everyone to know, he wanted all of us to know that he was special, that God had blessed him and that God had blessed others through him. Now, in Peter's case, notice he didn't do that. Notice, secondly, I mean, first of all, he gave glory to God, but notice, secondly, he didn't perform a dubious miracle. You know, if you, I was in that that faith healing movement for many, many years, and I never saw a miracle, even though I saw many claim, but certainly nothing that caused awe and fear. 
nothing that caused amazement so that I was beside myself. We were all sitting there kind of scratching our heads wondering if anything had happened. I mean, that's, that's how it went. So Peter was not patting himself on the back, but he was giving Lord, uh, the Lord Jesus that credit. And again, the miracle had everyone in utter and complete amazement. Secondly, he pointed to that miracle as God's proof that their covenant God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, had glorified, that is, had exalted the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that they had handed over to Pilate, the one that they had cried out for his crucifixion when Pilate had decided to release him, asking instead that a murderer be freed. Jesus did this. This is the proof that God has glorified his son. Now, the question would be, how could that be? How could that be true if Jesus was dead? Well, again, here comes the second piece of evidence, the witness. He wasn't dead. God had raised him again to life, a fact, Peter says, to which we are witnesses. Okay, this man believed in Jesus, is what, what um, Peter is saying. Not a Jesus who was dead, but a Jesus who was alive and who shows himself to be glorified through the evidence that he healed this man. Now, one thing we don't want to miss, too, is is what Jesus did for this man. He not only healed him, but he also gave him the faith to be healed. If you look in verse 16, Peter says this, the faith which comes through him, not merely faith in him, has given him this perfect health. So it's not that the man looked at Jesus and was, and was healed and saved, although that's true, but he says that faith by which he was healed and saved comes through Jesus. That's one thing that, that we understand in the Reformed faith that isn't often understood is that faith is a gift that God gives to us purely by his grace. We do not earn it. It's something he sovereignly gives. It's not something we work up on our own. It's something that Jesus gave to him by his Holy Spirit. But I want you again to notice the the proof or the evidence that Peter is pointing to. That Peter gave of Jesus' resurrection and glorification. The evidence that this man is healed. The fact that we are witnesses. He wasn't asking them simply to accept their bare word. Just believe it because I say it. He pointed to the miracle, he pointed to their testimony, not only his, but, and John, who was there with him, but to all the disciples who saw him. Remember in the Jewish mind that the only thing that was needed to prove anything in court was to have two or three witnesses that were willing to say this took place. Well, they had over 500 who saw Jesus at one time. Jesus was alive, they saw him alive, They saw him ascend. He was glorified. They were the recipients of the Holy Spirit poured out that showed them that he was the Lord. And so all these things are true. They used, again, pointed to the evidence. But now what does that mean for them, for the Jews? Well, they were in trouble because they were his executioners. Now, again, as we think about how we're going to imitate what what these are doing, what Peter and John are doing here and the other examples, we have to ask ourselves the question, where are we going to get the proof, right? Where are we going to get the proof that Jesus is exalted? Where are we going to get the proof these things are true, that he is raised from the dead? Well, again, we point to the evidence of this testimony that we have. The testimony of Peter and John, that Jesus was raised from the dead, that he, he did these miracles, Uh, Even the testimony of Luke that the disciples did these miracles. So the gospel writers, and remember Luke, when he did his gospel, that he went out and interviewed many people to find out what it is that Jesus did so that he could have the exact truth of these things. We point to their testimony. We point to their miracles. This is the evidence that God gives us. Okay, And it's, it's legitimate evidence because these Historic records, even if we just accepted them as historic documents that are reliable. We have several eyewitness testimonies to miracles, to a man who did miracles, who claimed to be God, to a man who died and was raised from the dead. Remember what John said? The spear went through his side and 
blood and water came out and there was a testimony from that. How could anyone survive that? But he was already dead. That's why they didn't break his legs. And then the spear threw his side and the fact that they buried him and he was in there for three days. But then the disciples again saw him. So these testimonies are testimonies given to us by eyewitnesses that we are to receive. And as I mentioned before, again, here's an apologetic. If these are reliable testimonies and of reliable witnesses who told us that Jesus did these miracles, that he was attested by a supernatural power by God, and he says he's God, and he says the scriptures are his word, then we know the Bible is his word. And once we know the Bible is his word, then we know that we can trust everything that it says. But we have more than that. We have the conviction of the Holy Spirit for ourselves. But again, how do we show it to other people? Well, this is what we need to do. And again, this is where I put in another plug for apologetics. Another thing that's very helpful to do is to prove from natural revelation, from what God shows us in nature, that he actually does exist. So there is not just a God who exists, but the God exists. Jesus claims to be the son of this God. He does miracles because of the power this God gives him. And Again, he claims to be God, and he claims the Bible to be the Word of God, and so we should accept that. So that's, again, why I would like us to, to look at apologetics. Sometimes as we get steeped in this world, and we hear and see all the unbelief around us, it can make us begin to sort of cool off and begin to lose sight of what the Bible says, that it is true, that there really are people who are in danger that we are really the ones who are called to reach out after them. And apologetics will help us take the Bible more seriously because it will give us a stronger conviction that these things are true. But it's also something the Spirit of God will use to bring others to Jesus. Again, we'll consider that as we move in that direction. But now having convicted his audience of murdering their Messiah, as he had done also on the day of Pentecost, Peter now preaches God's mercy. Notice something here again that we see again and again in Scripture. Law comes before the gospel, doesn't it? John the Baptist comes preaching before Jesus appears on the scene. First, there is the charge of guilt, the wounding, so to speak, of the law. Okay, you read the law, have you kept the law? No, well, what's the, what are the consequences of not keeping the law? The wages of sin is death. And so the wounds of the law, then come the message of grace, the healing balm of the gospel. Okay, so wounds and then healing balm. People don't pay attention unless what you are talking with them about concerns them. Now, by the time you're done explaining the law, they're usually pretty concerned, at least if the Spirit of God is, is working in them, even if they don't show it outwardly. Okay, so we need to do these things, even if we don't see the effects on, on people, it, they still think about it. And the Lord uses it to work in their hearts and their minds. Now, Peter tells his audience here, he knows that they did these things in ignorance and so did their rulers. Okay, they were mitigating circumstances. They didn't fully realize what they were doing. Now, this wasn't true of, of all the people. It wasn't true of all the rulers. We know on one occasion Jesus told the Pharisees who accused him of being in league with the devil that they would never be forgiven. Remember, they had committed the unpardonable sin because they had seen so much of the evidence, so many of the miracles, and Jesus doing everything the Messiah would, would do. And yet they still accused him of doing the things he did by the power of the devil. They had seen so much, but they still rejected him against the evidence. So there aren't always mitigating circumstances. And it wasn't true of all the Jews, but it was true of them. And so Peter fills them in that what God had announced through his prophets that his Christ would suffer, he had fulfilled. And again, notice he appeals to the Scriptures because they're Jews and they understand the Scriptures and they had respect for the Scriptures. And so you can use the Scriptures when that kind of circumstance is there. But with other types of other circumstances, other people who don't have that background, perhaps there are other things that we need to bring in as well. 
But then having shown them this, what were they to do? Peter says you need to repent, turn away from your sins. Turn back to God, believe in Him, trust in Him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says that if you will do this, your sins will be wiped away. That, that's, that's the good news of the gospel, isn't it? Their sins would be forgiven. No longer guilty, but they would be justified. He says the Lord would send times of refreshing, spiritual refreshing by His Holy Spirit. The same thing that the apostles and the disciples experienced on the day of Pentecost, refreshing by the Holy Spirit. And he said God would send Jesus to them. And I don't think he means here that he's going to send him bodily to set up his kingdom, which is kind of what a lot of churches believe today, but rather that he would come to dwell in them spiritually by faith. Remember what Paul said of himself, that uh, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Well, Christ lives in the soul of every believer. He will send Christ uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is not going to return bodily to set up his kingdom until he comes to make all things new again at the end of time. Now, again, there are many in our society who are ignorant regarding Jesus, you know, who he is, what he's done, uh, why he did what he did, why, why we need him. And so there is still hope for them. And so we need to get the good news out to them that if they will repent and trust in Jesus, they will be forgiven of all their sins. They will be refreshed by the Holy Spirit. They will be indwelt by the Lord Jesus. They will have eternal life. They will have a glorious future they can look forward to even as we do and no longer have to be afraid of hell. Now finally, Peter closes his sermon with further reasons that they should listen. And that's not the final point, but this is the final part of the sermon. He says, first of all, Moses had foretold that the Lord was going to raise up a prophet who was like him from the Jews, that's who Jesus was, that they should listen to him. But Moses also said if they did not listen to this prophet, they would be destroyed. And so the rest of the prophets said the same thing. In other words, you need to listen to Jesus. Otherwise, the Moses, whom you respect, who's a part of the Old Covenant Scriptures, says that you will be destroyed. So here is, here's another warning, okay? Motivation to get them to come to Jesus. But he didn't leave it with just negative motivation. He also encouraged them. He said to them, you are the sons of the prophets, the message of grace was meant for you. You are the sons of the covenant, the covenant God made with Abraham. God sent Jesus to you first to bless you by turning you away from your sins. That's a great privilege to have the Messiah first, to have the ministry of the Messiah, to be able to see and experience all of these things. Well, God did this for them to fulfill his promises to them, not only that they might be saved, but used by God also to bring the good news to others. Remember when, when the Lord says to Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Okay, he's talking mainly about Jesus. Paul draws that argument in Galatians. But then he's talking secondarily about the Jews because Jesus came to them first to convert them. And who are the first missionaries? They're essentially all Jews. And they become a blessing to all the nations by bringing the gospel out to them. But then ultimately, this means the seed of Abraham is everyone who believes like Abraham. That is, all true believers become a blessing to all the families of the earth because we are the ones now who have the gospel and the desire by the Holy Spirit to share this message with others so that they too might come to know him. So this is the encouragement to them in particular all this was meant for you. God sent him to you to turn you from your sins so that you might experience these blessings. So he gives them motivation, negative motivation. If you don't listen, you'll be destroyed. Positive motivation. God has singled you out and given you this privilege, first of all, so that you can be saved and also be a blessing to others. Now, when we share the gospel, we should also give reasons. We should also give motivations to believe. Hey, if you believe, you'll be saved. But if you reject God's grace, 
then things will only get worse for you and you will ultimately be destroyed. Now, perhaps like Peter, we should try to end on a positive note, okay? He talked about destruction first and then he talked about the blessing that God actually intended. So I think there's a lesson there as well. But the Lord would have us to give reasons, motivations, to get them to go a particular direction. Now, finally, we see the result of his sermon. The disciples were arrested. That was their reward. <laughs> but 5,000 were converted. Say, while they were speaking, the people who were in charge of the temple, the priests, the captain of the temple guard, the Sadducees, they all had to do with the temple. They were upset, first of all, because these two would be so bold as to teach in the temple. You know, that was for the teachers of the law, not for these two unlearned men. But they were also proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. Remember, they had already paid those who had, the guards who were guarding the tomb, they had already paid them off to say the disciples came and took him away and stole him. They don't want people to know about the resurrection. They don't want them to believe in the resurrection because that means that Jesus is the Messiah. So they were upset about this, teaching and proclaiming things they didn't want other people to believe, and so they arrested them and put them in jail. Now, Paul wrote to Timothy that all who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus warned us that the world would hate us. But unless we're willing to risk that hatred, we are never going to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. As long as we're afraid of that, we're not going to be able to, to obey Him. So we need to think about that. We need to think about that fear factor. But we also need to understand what happened because Peter and John were willing to face their fears in the power of the Holy Spirit. 5,000 were converted. Okay, it's because they were willing to stick their necks out and put their lives on the line. I mean, where did they go to proclaim the gospel but to the very center, the very public center of the Jewish religion? And because they were willing to do that, this man believed, but also many other people believed. So in closing, let me just simply say this. We need to pray that the Lord will make us willing to share the gospel. We need to pray that he would and that he would help us to overcome our fears because that's really the only thing that's stopping us, right? No one's going to be saved unless we can overcome those fears, but we need to overcome them in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord has given us this responsibility. We're, we're a part of the church. The Great Commission has been entrusted to the church. So we need to at least be reaching those people that we can reach, those people who are in our sphere. And our sphere, you know, is our family, uh, our neighbors, uh, and our workplaces, basically where we come in contact with people on a regular basis. The most effective way, build a bridge, build a relationship with them. Don't hide Christ, but let him come out of your life. Share. And then also learn to give reasons. A reason for the hope that is within you. You know, that's how we bear witness to the truth of the gospel, as well as living the life God calls us to live and sharing that gospel message. But let's pray, again from this example, that God would give us the courage to take those first steps and break through that fear and share his truth. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask for the Lord's grace to do that.